Today, I'm gonna to go through a case study to show you what your options are if you're 60 years old, a single household, and have about $1.6 million saved for retirement. And what you're gonna learn in this video is some options and levers that we pulled to help this individual see what they could reasonably expect to spend in retirement and how to do so in a way that will help them get the most out of their life with the money they had saved and also save on their lifetime tax bill. Once again, this is Matt. I'm a certified financial planner and advisor over at One Degree Advisors. And on this channel, I make videos to help you retire early with confidence. But before we dive into the numbers here, I wanna mention three things that you need to be aware of as you approach your own unique needs as a one person household. And the first one is that when you're planning for yourself only, your standard deduction is to be about half of what it would be if you're retiring as a couple. This means that it takes much less income before your income sources start to become taxable in retirement. So tax planning will be a little bit different here as opposed to most of the things you see online. Secondly, when it comes to spending, in my opinion, you need to have a little bit more of a cushion, whether that be for long-term care or having the funds to self-insure, because when you stop working and stop saving and you're not prepared for that, it could be pretty dangerous for your retirement. And thirdly, your objectives might be a little bit different. It may not be leaving behind a ton of money for someone or something, and you may wanna actually spend more to enjoy your friends and enjoy your family, and you're less worried about leaving us any sort of legacy goal here. Now, these three are some big ones. I know there, there are quite a few more, but let's get into the planning involved and go through this case study, see how much you can expect to spend if you retire at 60. And we're gonna go through some of the planning considerations that people often miss. Okay, so let's meet Jack, currently age 60. And this is not his real name, of course, but let's first start with the balance sheet. And as always, I'm using round and general numbers here for privacy, but if we break things down by account type, they have cash of around $60,000, a brokerage account of around $300,000, and an IRA with about $200,000. And lastly, their 401k with about $1.1 million in it. So if we're just looking at assets that they can expect to spend from retirement, that puts him just over 1.6 million in total investment assets in cash. And the only debt he has is a mortgage of around uh, $220,000 per year. That's a pretty low uh, interest rate mortgage here. All right, as far as retirement income goes, his future social security benefit is expected to be around $47,000 per year at full retirement age. But other than Social Security, his income will be purely dependent on his investment portfolio. Unless perhaps he takes on a little bit of part-time recreational work, well, he might earn a little bit of income, but maybe have a less stressful job, which is always an option too. All right, next, let's talk about expenses. Now, in order to retire, he would need to be able to cover all his core living expenses, which is about $6,000 per month on average, and that's, that's the baseline. Now, on top of that, we also wanna factor in those other variable expenses, which are those that we know will ultimately change throughout retirement. Now, the first one is gonna be his monthly mortgage payment, which is pretty low, and it's approximately $958 per month, and it was actually refinanced uh, recently. And I'll say, you know, ultimately a lot of folks in this position have the flexibility and liquidity to pay that off if they wanted to. But for now, at least for him, we'll want to maintain liquidity in that really low rate mortgage. Now, another expense is going to be private health insurance, and it's going to be around $1,000 per month for him. And that will start once his COBRA insurance expires and around 18 months after that. So that puts him at around $8,000 per month on average of expenses that we need to be covered in those initial years of retirement before he reaches Medicare age. So we went through the details of the balance sheet, his income and his expenses. Now let's put it all together and look at what this income uh, might look like throughout his retirement if he retires at age 60. And we wanna start by taking essentially a 10,000 foot view of some of Jack's monthly retirement income sources over time. And this is what it looks like visually. Now, as you can see, this big blue section right here is his monthly salary now, and that will stop at the end of the year when he officially retires. And for there, we can see right when he retires, he can generate a little bit over $8,000 per month 
from the portfolio. And again, that's assuming we're projecting out approximately a 7% uh, rate of return, your hypothetical rate of return from the portfolio on average. And we're also properly invested and diversified. And we see that we can generate additional money when he starts uh, paying for that private health insurance, about uh, a little over $9,000 here. And then we can see this little tabletop actually drops uh, once he's off and once he starts starts on Medicare. And this is accounting for things like taxes, inflation, uh, the, the returns we talked about, as well as his expenses. And also we're factoring in that he's one of the top quartiles for longevity, just to have a little bit more of a conservative cushion within this plan. And finally, the blue portion here is in 2032 or 2031 here is when he starts Social Security. So if we dig in a little bit deeper into the details and I scroll down here, we can see that from 62, when he has to start private health insurance before Medicare, his spending is gonna be up during that period, right? That's hence the tabletop I showed you guys earlier. And if we do some back of the napkin math, $114,000 here divided by, uh, assuming his investments grow by 7%, over $1.7 million, that's approximately a 6.7% uh, annual withdrawal rate. Now, if you're quick with math, you might be thinking, surely there's something wrong here. Matt, haven't you heard of the 4% withdrawal rule? Isn't that retirement planning 101? And what I really wanna educate folks on here is that the 4% rule fails to account for things like other cash flows like social security. And also the biggest is the ability to be dynamic. So instead of being rigid and just burying your head in the sand and saying, I'm always gonna take 4% regardless of market circumstances, you're instead flexible and you're willing to adjust your income slightly in retirement. By doing so, you unlock the ability not to miss out on all that potential income when markets do well and also not stick your head in the sand and run out of money when, not if, markets have corrections. And we also know that a 6.7% withdrawal rate, again, is not his lifetime withdrawal rate. That's only in those early years when he needs to take a little bit more income before he starts Medicare. And also we're factoring in once he starts social security, uh, his income is gonna drop by that amount and he's still gonna be spending the same amount of money, just less is gonna come from his portfolio. Now in his portfolio withdrawal rate actually is gonna be more in the 3% range once that actually happens. But the key, and I don't wanna understate this, is that a flexible withdrawal plan like this only works if you're willing to adjust your income when not if markets decline also when those other income sources kick in like social security. And really, in my opinion, the 4% rule was a great start. And again, a rules of thumb aren't bad. It's the best we had at the time, but the subsequent research has improved and people can now see that the data and, and they can have more confidence that they can retire earlier than expected. And using the data, we can see that he has the spending capacity to bridge the gap for a few years prior to Social Security. That way he can let Social Security be higher and lock in that inflation adjusted uh, guaranteed income from the government for the rest of his life. So how does this look in practice? Why can he take more than the 4% rule? And you'll see here that if the portfolio were to drop by 27% based on the way he's invested, your income would need to be dropped by around $360 per month, which is about a 4% reduction, which is a requirement for the system. And for some historical context, if we look at a simple portfolio of 60% Vanguard total stock uh, index fund and 40% iShares core US aggregate bond index, and in the last 15 years, the largest decline has been 23%, again, assuming you rebalance your portfolio at the end of each year. And if we expand the time horizon by 20 years, then we capture the great financial crisis. And the largest decline during that period was 35.5%. And the drawdown lasted nearly three years. So you would have needed to adjust your income downward if you're using the system. So finally, let's take a look at his tax projection because for many of you watching, taxes will likely be your largest lifetime expense and it's worth paying careful attention to how you withdraw from your accounts because it can make a significant difference. For him, we can see that taxes are projected to be very low in those early years and essentially ramp up as he ages. And that's mainly because of two reasons. You know, if we follow the traditional rule of thumb of taking income from taxable accounts first, then IRA accounts or tax deferred accounts, and finally Roth IRA accounts, we end up with a situation where very little tax is generated early on, which can feel really good and make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside early on, but over 80% of his assets in his situation are in those tax deferred accounts. And I often make this joke, but the IRS is not so patiently waiting to take 30 to 40% of his accounts and taxes because of required 
minimum distributions. And then secondly, you know, he's retiring at age 60. He's gonna have a period of time before social security kicks in, a time when he has essentially no income uh, recognized so he can be strategic in how he recognizes that income. This is known as the retirement tax valley and it's a golden planning opportunity if you're doing it right. So what you're looking at my screen now is that sort of a summary we use to run this type of Roth conversion analysis for clients we work with over the long term. And what's happening here is we're running analysis based on the balance sheet, uh, life expectancy, and assuming approximately a 7% annualized rate of return like we talked about. And what we wanna do is optimize this withdrawal strategy and say based on all these different factors, what would be a withdrawal plan that would give you the lowest possible lifetime tax bill and the highest amount of net income. So in his case, we found that based on the situation, if we were to fill up the 24% tax bracket with Roth conversions while paying him an income during those years of you know no working and before social security, which I'll show you in a second, as opposed to going the taxable, tax deferred and tax free rule of thumb route, the taxes saved over his lifetime, if we compare the two strategies, is approximately $847,000 dollars, which is about $298,000 in today's dollars. And we also hear that their average tax rate drops by around 10.5% or 6.7% uh, in today's dollars. And what we did was we compared 13 different withdrawal strategies across every single tax bracket. And the sweet spot for him to give him the lowest lifetime tax bill was that 24% tax bracket. So if we look at a similar picture of the tax valley in comparison with Roth conversions, the blue is gonna be the taxes paid over their lifetime if we add on Roth conversions. And the yellow, again, is just if we went with that rule of thumb route. You can see that those years, there would be basically little to no income tax, 2025 through 2038 or so. And what this is doing is sort of smoothing out the ride and purposely recognize a little bit of more income each year up to that 24% tax bracket to the point when about 2034, this tax table is showing their projected tax bill on an annual basis here. They're gonna be done making their tax payments for life and that's because all their tax deferred accounts are in that tax-free or taxable bucket at this point. Now, as many of you know, there is gonna be a break-even point because again, you're sort of front-loading some of the taxes paid at that lower tax bracket, which for him was the 24% bracket, rather than playing the waiting game and going the traditional retirement route. He'd be forced to, in that higher tax bracket later on due to required minimum distributions in his 70s. And when it comes to these projections, it is a good mix of art and science because none of us know how long you will be in retirement, which is just a nice way of me saying, I don't know how long you're gonna be alive. And secondly, I don't know what future tax rates are. If the government does in fact raise taxes in future, this could potentially uh, look even better and it can go opposite ways. This is a very personal choice and one that you wanna know all the different trade-offs for. But in order to know if this makes sense for you in your situation, you need to understand if the benefit of doing this will exceed some of those trade-offs. So I made a video going through another case study of your retiree and I go into a lot further detail on Roth conversions for early retirement and you can watch that by clicking right here. Again, this is Matt. I'm a certified financial planner advisor over at One Degree Advisors. If you'd like to talk with me or someone on my team about your financial plan, you can click the link in the description and you can go through our early retirement assessment where we can talk about your financial plan and if you are ready to retire early. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys on the next one.